If I asked you to tell me a movie that has cartoons and humans acting side by side, you'd probably say Who Framed Roger Rabbit, or Space Jam, or Space Jam 2. Which is goofy, cause that was a blatant cash grab. I slam my penis in the car door. You slam your penis in the car door. But I'm pretty sure you wouldn't come at me with Looney Tunes back in action. And if you did, I'd ask you to coffee, cause whenever I bring this movie up, people usually either give me shit for it, or they don't know what I'm talking about. But with all the Warner Brothers drama circling around right now, it seems like a good time to revisit the movie that changed the direction of the Looney Tunes franchise almost 20 years ago. Looney Tunes Back in Action is a 2003 live action and animated comedy starring Brendan Fraser, Steve Martin, Bugs Bunny, and Daffy Duck. And you know what? This movie's underrated. Well, I say he does have to shoot me now! Bugsy! Bugsy, buddy! Oh, hi! Uh, what's up, duck? <laughs> Death never misses a cue. What am I talking to you for? All you have to do is munch on a carrot and people love you. And if he always comes back, I just tell him how much I need him. We hug, we cry. All credit for saving the human race goes to... Daffy. Daffy. Oh, no, you don't, Buster. It's a good look for you. Do you really think so? What's up, Doug? Oh, shoot, stop with me. So the film opens on a classic duck season versus wabbit season argument, but flips the scene on its head when it's revealed that Daffy Duck is reading the script for it at a table read. So basically, in this movie, cartoons are actors working for Warner Brothers who live in the real world. Daffy gets tired of being paired up with Bugs Bunny and wants his own cartoon, which promptly gets him fired by Kate, the very unfunny vice president of comedy. DJ, an aspiring stuntman and current security guard, is asked to escort Daffy off the lot, but through a series of wacky hijinks, Daffy gets him fired too. Kate and Bugs Bunny go on a mission to get Daffy back, and what follows is one of the most silly, convoluted plot lines I've seen in a long time. But in a good way. I like it, but I don't want to tell you the whole plot and piece out like a lot of creators do because that's not a movie review, that's a glorified synopsis. If you want to see the plot of a film, just go watch the movie instead of listening to someone recount it for 10 minutes. I guarantee you'll have a better experience. Anyway, this is underrated and overhated the art of Looney Tunes back in action. You know, I thought about doing character analysis for this movie, but the truth is, it just doesn't go deep enough for that to be interesting to me. Anyway, give me the monkey! No, forget that, man, you're evil. DJ Drake is a babe, obviously we love Brendan Fraser, Kate Houghton is an icy she-wolf, plus she's the most offensive character in the movie, both in the one-dimensional way she was written and the things she says. The cross-dressing thing in the past, funny, today, disturbing. You got no music in your soul, sister. I am aware of that. Lady, if you don't find a rabbit with lipstick amusing, you and I have nothing to say to each other. And the relationship was shoehorned in, and everyone involved is in on how corny it is. And Steve Martin is cartoony villain perfection, I expect nothing less. Silly walk and all. How'd you like to do a little kissing later? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what they all say at first. Hey yo, what the fuck? What interests me more is the relationship between Bugs and Daffy and the way they changed and evolved it to accommodate a feature-length film. Their conflicted working relationship is the first domino to fall in this movie's plot. And despite the context flip of them turning into actual movie stars instead of just, you know, being drawings starring in cartoons, I think their characterization was preserved pretty well. Then bam, wham, bam. And your tail is on fire. Exactly my point. The no, really, your tail's on fire. Daffy's sense of logic and morality is separate from basically everyone else's and they all think he's crazy, so that seems consistent to the rest of the Looney Tunes media. And I've never been a huge Bugs Bunny fan, I always found him a little bit smarmy and annoying, and sure, he's like that in this movie too, but at least this time around, he likes Daffy and he's trying to convince him to come back to work at Warner Brothers. I feel like a lot of the time when characters get brought into a more sensational context, they can get flanderized and stretched into something else for the purpose of money making. But I feel that they were written pretty genuinely in this case, and it even made me like Bugs more. Kiki. I'm not so sure that this movie is written for children. To me, it feels like more of a movie for fans of Looney Tunes of all ages. Like, yeah, there aren't really any swear words or anything, but there are references kids wouldn't get, like the Bugs Bunny psycho shower sequence. <laughs> 
and the humor is just more grown up and topical than I would have expected for a movie that I used to watch all the time when I was like seven or eight years old. Sell all my Warner Brothers stock. I got an inside tip that Bugs Bunny's about to die. <laughs> When it comes to the story itself, it's an absolute roller coaster with many wacky twists and turns, but I actually think that it works because the Looney Tunes have always been that way and they have a habit of getting into ridiculous situations. The dialogue in this film's pretty good. You, him, her, them. Me trying to figure out what the hell people should call me. My favorite visual gag is when Joan Cusack's professor character goes, I knew this day would come and then smashes the button that is labeled as such. It's so unnecessary and silly and great. Another one is shortly after when the gang questions how to get to Paris and Bugs simply says like this and pulls the screen up to reveal a French landscape. This type of cartoony logic is what keeps the pacing of the movie fresh and engaging and it definitely wouldn't be as fun if it were more grounded in reality. Dynamite? Look at this dynamite! <laughs> Welcome to my world. And actually, I think the costuming in this film lends itself to that too. The actors look just cartoony enough to uphold the idea that they're existing in the same space as the Looney Tunes. And of course, you know, film grain also helps everything blend seamlessly. The music in this movie, apart from the random Olivia Newton-John performance, mostly consists of a couple snippets of pop songs and non-diegetic orchestral tracks to accompany the action as was common in older animation and lots of Looney Tunes shorts. When Yosemite Sam's on screen, it's inspired by westerns. That's another component contributing to the success of the blended reality in this movie. Love to every type of animator, but I'm a 2D animation stan. There are certainly movies using 3D that I enjoy, but if you gave me the choice, I'd pick 2D every time. I used to study hand-drawn animation, and any chance to watch high-quality character movement and color work is an absolute treat for me. And this movie has so much of that, probably because Eric Goldberg directed the animation. You could throw the scenes of the cartoon characters on shuffle, and it would always look nice. I wasn't sure how it was going to look going in given the era it was produced, the early onset of digital, the beginning of the end of analog, but I adore it. We don't get animation that looks like this anymore, my friends. There are a couple of funny looking low texture 3D monsters in Area 52, but I just take it with a grain of salt considering the time period. I love that weird green hand monster thing, and that dog is just Poochie. Y'all remember Poochie? I had a blue one. Interactive Poochie comes with his own bone. By far my favorite artistic moment of the movie is the sequence where Daffy and Bugs run through the paintings in the Louvre to escape Elmer Fudd. Every different style looks excellent, and in the last one they even use the pointillism style that they're in to shatter Elmer Fudd into a million tiny dots. So obviously, unfortunately, the cartoon characters were not in the space with the actors when they shot the movie, so they had a pretty cool strategy for creating authentic interactions. Each scene with cartoon characters involved was filmed three times. First, a rehearsal with a fake stuffed stand-in, and then with nothing in the frame, and finally with a mirror ball in the shot to indicate to the animators where the light sources were, and then the animators added the characters into the scenes. So, a quick history lesson. This movie actually began development as Space Jam 2, but Michael Jordan wasn't interested. Then, they tried reworking it as Spy Jam, starring Jackie Chan. And they were also in talks to make Race Jam with this white dude. He's a NASCAR driver. I bet they're glad that didn't happen. In the early 1990s, Gremlins director Joe Dante wanted to produce a biographical comedy with HBO called Termite Terrace. It was centered around Chuck Jones' early years at Warner Brothers in the 1930s. But Warner Bros basically said that's an old story with period stuff going on and we want to be modern. So instead, Dante agreed to direct back in action as a tribute to Chuck Jones. Dante disliked how Space Jam represented the Looney Tunes brand and personalities, and he wanted Back in Action to be the antithesis of Space Jam. Dante's account of the experience makes it seem like WB was much more focused on references and market appeal that surely would have dated the movie into oblivion. He said it was a pretty grim experience and called it the longest year and a half of his life. 
Ultimately, Dante felt that Warner Brothers interfered so much that it completely changed the beginning, middle, and end of the movie from what his vision was. With the news going around at the time of this video dropping about the HBO Max and Discovery Plus merger and the mass outcry at so many projects being canceled and mistreated, it seems that Warner Brothers will not be prioritizing artistic vision or diverse storytelling anytime soon, and it's a damn shame. Despite positive reviews from Roger Ebert and Richard Roper, as well as several award nominations, the movie ended up being the last one produced by Warner Brothers Feature Animation. Warner Bros. had been hoping to use Back in Action to breathe new life into the franchise, but the movie earned 68.5 mil against an 80 million budget, so the Looney Tunes stayed on TV until Space Jam 2, and the Feature Animation studio shut down in 2004 and was folded into Warner Bros. Animation. Additionally, the Xbox and Windows versions of the game that shared the movie's name were cancelled due to the film not making a profit, but there are versions on PlayStation 2, GameCube, and GBA. I think this movie works because anyone who loves cartoons probably has at some point wanted to dive into an animated world, and it's awesome to see these characters come to life in our reality. The dinner scene where Shaggy and Scooby are both eating Scooby snacks and chewing out Matthew Lillard was gold to me when I was a kid. As I said earlier, they kept the other elements of the movie goofy and over the top in order to match the cartoon characters from the functions of the car to the story itself. I've always loved the concept of a universe where cartoons are real actors in our plane of existence, and seeing them as working individuals rather than trapped inside of certain scenarios is refreshing and creative even if it is a little fanfiction-y. There's a scene of Wile E. Coyote going after Roadrunner with no cameras around though, so that raises some questions what's going on there. <laughs> My initial takeaway after watching this movie was honestly just that it's way better than I remembered or expected. Whenever I brought this movie up for the longest time, people would just laugh at me and tell me Space Jam is better, which is the most dismissive response you could possibly give about such a huge and art-intensive project. My takeaway? Animation is beautiful. WB should have given this franchise more chances at a feature film rather than shutting it down for 18 years just to bring it back for what was essentially just a giant ad. And most of all, things don't always have to be so serious. Back in Action had the same budget and, in my opinion, a much more engaging story than Space Jam. I went my entire young life believing this fact, and then somewhere in growing up, I let people convince me that it wasn't as good as I remembered. But this movie is a banger. This was one of my favorite movies when I was a kid, and I remember throwing it on with my siblings, and hours after, my little brother would still be singing Viva Las Vegas around the house with his toy guitar. Thanks so much for joining me today, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover next. I've got more film reviews and series retrospectives on my list, along with some personal essays. Did you see this movie when you were younger? Was this video the first time you heard about it? Do you have a favorite incarnation of Looney Tunes? Mine is the Looney Tunes show from the early 2010s, so I might take a stab at reviewing it someday since it's kind of character focused. Anyway, stay hydrated, be kind to yourself, tell your friends you love them, because you never know when they're going to go, and I'll see you next time. Bye! I am the queen of the universe, the way it's time. <laughs>